And tonight, what I'd like to do is just take the opportunity to talk about the subject of baptism while we have one. Um, so go to Acts chapter 2 tonight. If you take your Bibles and open to the book of Acts chapter 2 and look down at verse number 41 and verse 42. So I'm just going to touch on the subject tonight and talk about just a few things. And uh, um, I think that uh, it's an important subject to understand and make sure we get right. A young minister fresh from the Baptist seminary was conducting his first baptismal service. He was very nervous. He got his ordinances mixed up. And uh, he, was, uh, he, he, he got his scriptures confused concerning baptism and the Lord's Supper. And uh, so he said when he was baptized in the convert, he said, I, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when he put them under, he said, now drink ye all of it, <laughs> which would be a hard thing to do uh, for them to drink all of it. <laughs> There seems to be a lot of confusion on baptism today, and we, you know, like to clear up some of that biblically. I'm not sure I'll get it done in one sermon here tonight, but there does need to be clarification on the subject. Virtually every religious denomination in existence teaches some form of baptism as a part of their doctrine, and the diversities on the subject are very wide. So I want to just give a basic understanding of what the Bible has to say with regard to baptism. And there are just about th just three truths under three headings we could call it. Number one is the mandate for baptism. It's very clear from the Bible that this is a mandate for believers. Once a person makes their commitment to Jesus Christ, once they put their faith in Christ, uh, the Bible says that they are to follow him in believers' baptism. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Go ye therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and, and behold, I'm with you always. And so this was Jesus' word to the church. Jesus gave, as Aaron said tonight, two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper. We call them ordinances because they were ordained by the Lord Jesus. And Jesus gave the ordinance of baptism just before he ascended into heaven to be with his Father. And all the words that Jesus spoke are important, but I think there's something special about the last words that Jesus gives before he ascends into heaven about believers following him in baptism. So it's the obligation of the Christian then to follow the Lord in baptism. Now, Jesus himself kind of gives an example of this. Jesus not only commands baptism at the end of his public ministry, but Jesus himself submitted himself to baptism at the beginning of his public ministry. And some, some people will immediately raise the question, why did Jesus need to be baptized? I mean, uh, baptism, after all, is a symbol of repentance, of being saved from your sin. Jesus, the sinless Savior, did not need to be saved from any sin. So why was Jesus baptized then? Why did he submit to baptism? You remember John the Baptist, who was baptizing in the River Jordan. Uh, when Jesus came to him, he was very reluctant. He said, look, uh, I need to be baptized by you, and you're coming to me. Uh, you know, the shoes on the other foot here. Let me, you baptize me. And Jesus, of course, the Son of God, said, you know, let, let it be. That is to say, permit this to happen. Um, why did Jesus feel it necessary to be baptized? We'll just give you three quick reasons. First of all, obligation. Jesus felt obligated because he said in verse 15 of that passage, he felt that he had to fulfill all righteousness. So he said, let me be baptized, John, because I have to fulfill every part of righteousness. That is, I have to dot every I and cross every T in my life. God the Father was asking this of Israel for them to obey all of what God commanded. And now I, the Son of God, must do the same. I must submit and obey in everything that the Father has uh, given me. To be the sin bearer of the nation, it was incumbent upon him to fulfill every requirement that God demanded of Israel. Jesus was scrupulous, scrupulous excuse me, in that and, uh, and all those things. But another reason for this was identification. Jesus, in his baptism, was actually identifying with sinners. He was identifying with the people who would be saved. Now, we, when we're baptized... We identify with the Savior who saved us. But Jesus, when he was baptized, he identified with the sinners that he would save. So there's identification in that. And there's also another thing that we could say, and that would be anticipation. 
The baptism of Jesus Christ looks forward to his baptism of suffering on the cross. Jesus, on the cross, baptized his soul, his body and soul, in suffering for sin. And so his, his baptism there at, at the River Jordan looked forward to the fact that he would die for man's sins, that he would be buried, that he would rise again the third day. It looked forward to the cross of Christ. The shadow of the cross fell on the banks of the Jordan River when Jesus was baptized there that day. And, and by doing all this, Jesus himself was setting an example for all believers that what the next step of faith, after you profess faith in Jesus Christ, after you realize that you're a sinner, that our works can't save us, it's all the work of Christ, it's what he did on the cross, salvation is a gift that is given, once, and we receive it by faith, putting our faith in what Jesus did on the cross. Once we understand that, we repent and, and put faith in Christ, then it's the obligation of the believer to follow the Lord in baptism. And the Bible says this in Acts 2.41, you're there. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. The same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Uh, those who received his word, therefore they trusted in Christ for salvation. So on that day there, the Bible speaks about in the book of Acts, 3,000 souls after they had received the word, they were baptized in one day. Can you imagine? In one day, they were all being baptized there. And when we also read in the book of Acts that when Philip preached the gospel in Samaria, that um, we read that when they believed Philip as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God and in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. They believed in Jesus Christ. And then they were baptized right after that. And that is the biblical pattern. Now, with regard to this, the practice of baptism has been carried out by immersion. Um, that is, we, we, we take, the, as you saw here tonight, the candidate, they, they go fully under the water, they come up out of the water. Why do we do that? You know, why do we, why do we build a, 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 a little... Uh, jacuzzi back here, a little pool of water, and, and take people and we put them in the water for full immersion. Why do we do that? Well, by the way, not every denomination believes in baptism by full immersion. Some use sprinkling um, for their mode of baptism. Um, I think I've told you before that one time I preached in a Methodist church that had a cup of water there. It was a very ornate cup. I thought it was for me to drink, and it was actually their baptistry. So I drank their baptistry dry there in the service. And uh, so they had to go get more holy water. I did feel a whole lot better, though, after drinking that water. <laughs> Just kidding. There are some who believe in sprinkling, some who believe in full immersion. And why is that? Because the Greek word that talks about baptism is baptizo, which is full Immersion. The word always means full immersion. Whenever um, a ship sank to the bottom of the ocean, the Greek would use the word baptizo. Whenever a woman would submerge a piece of cloth completely under, die, the word was used baptizo. So it always has the meaning of full immersion. Whenever you see the word baptize in the New Testament, don't get the idea that it's always talking about the ordinance of water baptism. Sometimes it could be talking about being fully immersed in something else. For example, Jesus said in Luke chapter 12 that he would, be, uh, he would take upon him the baptism of sin. It describes the baptism that Christ would take on the cross. And what it meant was he would be fully immersed. On the cross, Jesus took the sins of the world upon himself. And so that's what he was talking about. It also describes Jesus' baptism of suffering, which means he was fully immersed in suffering. And in Romans 6, 1 through 5, it describes how a believer is baptized into Jesus Christ. So what happens when a person is saved? And I've used this illustration before, but let's just say, uh, let me see up here. I have this little piece of paper. This represents me. All right. This, this bulletin here represents Adam. Before I was saved, oops, sorry about that. Before I was saved, I was in Adam. Whatever happened to Adam 
happened to me. What happened to Adam in the garden? He fell, right? When Adam fell, I fell with him. Because in Adam was all of humanity. In Adam's fall, we sinned all, as the old saying goes. The Bible says, wherefore by his one man, uh, sin entered the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men. For that all have sinned, aorist tense. All humanity was in Adam, and therefore we are sinners in Adam. We die because of Adam's sin. Now, what happens at salvation? When you get saved, what God does is he takes you out of Adam. I let this Bible represent Jesus. And he baptizes me, fully immerses me in Christ. And there I am. I'm in Christ. You're taken out of Adam. You're placed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that, beloved, is a spiritual reality. That's what happens at salvation. And for the rest of your life, you are now one with Christ. You understand that? The Bible says that we're already seated with Christ in heavenly places. We're so one with Christ that in the mind of God, we're already there. We're already seated with Christ in heaven. Sometimes people say, you know, I hope I'm going to heaven. Are you going to heaven? I'm saying, I'm already there. I'm already there. I hope to see you. But the truth of the matter is, because I'm in Christ, I'm so united to him that wherever Jesus is, I'm there with him because we are one with Christ. Now, you say, I don't understand that. Well, neither do I. And that's why theologians call it the mystical union of Christ. Mystical in the fact that it's, it's far beyond our ability to comprehend this spiritual truth. It's so far above us. And yet it's a reality. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ that lives in me. And so baptism, water baptism, is a symbol of the spiritual reality that took place when you got saved. You understand that? It's, it's, a, it's a symbol of a spiritual reality. You went under the water because when Christ died, you were with him. You died with him. When he rose, you rose with him. Or he, when he was buried, you were buried with him. When he rose, you rose with him. And now already you are in the mind of God, seated with Christ in heavenly places. You are so one with Christ. In fact, the way Jesus said it, he said it like this. I am the vine and you are the branches. And there's no distinction. There's no separation from the branches and the vine. You're connected to Jesus Christ. You're one with Christ. And what are baptism symbolizes that spiritual reality. Uh, Now, there's no way you can get that out of sprinkling, that that reality, that spiritual reality that water baptism is supposed to communicate. You don't get that out of just sprinkling water. That has to be done with full immersion. Why? Because you are fully immersed in Christ. Thank God I wasn't sprinkled in. I was fully immersed in Christ. And, and so, so it is. Now you say, well, now, what, so why do certain denominations sprinkle a person with water rather than baptizing by immersion? This came to, to be due to a serious error regarding the meaning of baptism. You see, some taught that water baptism is what saved a person. They thought that when you got baptized in the water, that's when you actually got saved. No, water baptism doesn't save you. Water doesn't save anyone, all right? If I believe that water saved you, I've said this before, I would bring a fire hose out here and I'd I'd just blast every one of you. (laughs) And I'd say, my job's done. You know, next, next, next congregation. Water doesn't save you. So where did they get this idea? Well, this came through the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church began to teach that um, when you baptize an infant in water, by sprinkling, by the way, Um, that grace is infused into them, that the moment that that infant is baptized with water, that they're saved at that moment, and grace is infused inside of them that moment that that they're baptized. And uh, they now are justified, they're saved. However, they can lose that salvation according to the Catholic Church. How do you lose that? Well, with mortal sins. With a mortal sin, you kill the grace of God. And so what do you have to do after that? You get rebaptized. I mean, it would make sense to me that if you got saved through water baptism, you just go back and be baptized again. 
But the Catholic Church doesn't say that because they say when you were baptized by water, it left an indelible mark. Now, I'm not sure what an indelible mark is. I don't think they know either. But, but what you have to do is you have to add works now. You have to go do penance. You have to say so many Hail Marys. You have to do all these other things. Because uh, what you want to do then is you want to, you want to add to your, uh, what you, your salvation. You kind of lost it, but now you can get it back by your own works. So it's faith plus works. Now, originally the Catholic Church began to baptize by immersion, but they changed it um, later on. Why? During the Black Plague, when so many people were dying, the church baptized these people through sprinkling, thinking it would save them and prevent them from hell. And then in 1311 AD, the Roman Catholic Church at the Council of Ravana officially made sprinkling an allowable mode of baptism. Now, later after the Reformation, the Church of England adopted sprinkling by vote of Parliament. I always love it when we get Bible doctrine from uh, Congress or the government try to, tries to tell us how to, uh, to interpret the Bible. Uh, and then later on, under the Church of England, it was voted by Parliament. Sprinkling would be allowable as a proper mode of baptism. Now, when the 88 scholars of the King James Version began to translate the Bible into the King James English or the, or the King James Version under the authority of King James, they understood that King James was uh, Anglican, that he was the king, uh, and that, you know, therefore head of the church since Henry VIII made himself head of the church. Every other king has been head of the church since then. By the way, Jesus is the head of the church, no earthly king. But that's what the Anglican Church taught. And so King James was Anglican. The King James translators didn't want to do anything to make the king mad at them. And so when they came to this issue of baptism, and they came to the Greek word baptize, baptizo, they could either translate it literally, and if you translate the word literally, it would mean immersion. Rather than doing that, they said, you know what, we're going to transliterate the word rather than translate the word. Transliteration is just taking the Greek letters and turning them into English letters. The Greek letters, baptizo, were turned into the English letters, baptize. And they basically said to, you know, the king and whoever read the version, look, this is what the Greek word is. You, you interpret it however you want to. If you want to interpret that to mean sprinkling, that's okay. If you want to interpret that to mean immersion, that's okay. But you interpret it however you want to, and thus they were able to save their heads by getting out of that dilemma. Now you say, well, now wait a minute. The Bible does mention sprinkling. Yes, it does, but it's never in reference to baptism. For example, in Hebrews 9.13, it mentions the sprinkling of the blood. And when it mentions sprinkling, it uses an entirely different Greek word. It's rantizo. Rantizo, which means sprinkling, is never used in the Bible with reference to water baptism. Whenever the Bible refers to water baptism, it is always speaking of full immersion. Always. For example, in Mark 1.5, people were baptized by John in the river Jordan. The Greek preposition there, in, there's no doubt about what it means. It doesn't mean beside or by or near, but they were actually in the river. You only get in the river if you're going to be immersed, fully immersed. Mark also tells us that when Jesus had been baptized, he came up out of the water. He was actually in the Jordan River, and after he was baptized, he came up out of the water. Again, showing that he was in the water, fully immersed. John's gospel tells us further that John the Baptist was baptizing at Anan near Salim because there was much water there. Well, you wouldn't need much water if you were sprinkling. In fact, I could have got the job done tonight just with this bottle here if we believed in sprinkling. You don't need a whole lot of water if you're just going to sprinkle, but you only need a lot of water if you're going to baptize by immersion. And so also there's the story in Acts chapter 8, verse 36, when Philip had shared the gospel with the Ethiopian eunuch. As they went along the road, they came to some water, and the newly converted, newly saved eunuch said, hey, 
What doth hinder me to be baptized? Why did he say that? Well, he said that because they came upon a pool of water where he could be immersed in the water. Again, I can't imagine Philip or the eunuch traveling through the desert without at least having a bottle of water with him. I mean, if all you need to do is sprinkle, you could have got that done with your bottle of water. But they stopped, and he was baptized. He said, see, see here is water. What's to prevent me? Again, that all implies full immersion. And so there's the mandate for baptism. But then let me talk to you about the meaning of it, the meaning of it. In Romans chapter 6, would you just take a moment and just turn there, uh, Romans chapter 6. I already kind of alluded to this already, but we'll look at it one more time before we move on. The, gospel, or the book of Romans chapter 6, verse 1. Here in this passage, we see, again, the spiritual reality of what baptism means, is what Paul's talking about. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. What's Paul doing here? He's answering an argument that was given to him about his gospel. You see, the Bible teaches that once you're saved, you're always saved. You can't lose it. And someone would say, well, wait a minute. If I'm, if I can't, if I'm saved and I can't lose it, no matter what I do, that means I can just go out and I can just sin all I want to. And, and I guess you could look at it that way. Some people say that. But what does Paul say about that, that kind of thing? Well, again, in verse 1, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Is that the attitude of a believer? Is a true believer going to say, hey, now that I'm saved and I can't lose it, I have a license to go out and do whatever I want? No, we don't think that way. Why not? Here's why. Verse 2, God forbid... How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer there? And here's the argument. Look at verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death, therefore were buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. So what's Paul's whole argument why a true believer is not going to have that attitude? Because a true believer is going to understand that you were taken out of Adam and you were baptized into Christ. And that reality, that spiritual reality of knowing you were placed into Christ is going to keep you from going out and living any way you want to or a licentious, sinful life. You know why? Because you're so one with Christ that wherever you go, you take Christ with you. Wherever you go, you take Christ with you. That's what Paul said to the Corinthians. Some of the Corinthians were, you know, they were living in sin. They were living in fornication, and, and uh, they were justifying it with a slogan. They would say, oh, you know, meats for the belly and the belly for meats. You know, it's just natural, Paul. You need to loosen up. You know, we have our liberty. And Paul basically destroyed all of that by saying, don't you know that when you do those things, you take Christ with you wherever you go? Will you make Christ the member of a harlot, Paul said? Will you actually do that? Will you bring Christ with you to that place where you're not supposed to go? What was Paul appealing to there? He was appealing to that your oneness with Jesus, the fact that you are identified with Christ. And again, that's what Paul is talking about, the meaning, the spiritual reality that you are one with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's important for you to understand this as a believer. You say, why? Well, it will help you to understand your source of strength and power. You can't live the Christian life. You understand that? If you, you, you try, but only Christ can do it through us. And we're so one with Christ. He is our source of strength. He's our source of power. He is the one who gives us Life, again, he's the vine, we are the branches, the, the branches get their life 
They get all of their resource and sustenance through the vine. And a branch is just simply bearing fruit because of the resource and the strength that the vine gives. Uh, a bearing fruit is just a, a, a branch that's healthy and not cut off from the vine. You see, so it all comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the real meaning of baptism. And let me just speak to you about one final thing regarding this. We talked about the mandate. We actually talked about the mode and the meaning, but here's the misunderstanding again. It's a sad irony to me that in the history of a church, this subject you know, is really divisive rather than uniting. Paul said there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, but sincere godly believers differ over uh, this one baptism uh, in Christ. And so, um, again, mo- most Reformed churches today baptize infants, but they deny that infant baptism confers regeneration on those baptized. So when the Reformation took place and Protestant churches came out of the Catholic Church, you know, like Lutheran churches and Presbyterian churches and Anglican churches and others, the Reformation was wonderful because it got the church back to the gospel, the saving gospel of Jesus Christ. But sadly, each of these Protestant denominations took out of those, out of the Catholic Church, remnants of Catholicism. The Reformation was not complete. And the Westminster Confession of Faith basically says that baptism is a, is, is a sacred, is sacred of the New Testament ordained by Jesus Christ, not only for the solemn admission of the partly baptized into a visible church, but also to be unto him a sign and a seal of the covenant of grace, of his engrafting into Christ, of regeneration, of remission of sins. And what they're saying here, this is very confusing and otherwise incredibly wonderful doctrinal statement. They basically say here that you can be a member of the covenant of grace without being regenerated or being saved. And I never could understand that. And that the sign and the seal of being in the covenant was this this sign of baptism. And that's why they baptize infants. They say when they baptize an infant today, they don't say that the infant is getting saved. They just say, well, this is just a sign or a seal of the covenant of grace. And and again, that's somewhat confusing because... the infant isn't saved at that moment, and, uh, and yet they're being baptized. And I would just throw at you, uh, brethren, that there's not one illustration in the New Testament of infant baptism, not one. Not one. That is all inferred. That is all theology carried with out of the Catholic Church. It was a ritual that would, they did not want to give up. Part of the reason for that was the state... It was a battle they were not willing to fight with regard to the state because back in that day, the way they registered uh, people in the state for taxes, you were registered when you were baptized as an infant. And if you're no longer baptizing infants, you're no longer registering with the state to pay taxes, and that would incur the wrath of the state upon the church. So rather than saying this is not a biblical mode of baptism, they basically tried to incorporate infant baptism into the New Testament, which, beloved, is just simply not there. It's just not there. That's another subject for another time where I can get into deeper when I'm a little bit more angry than I am tonight. But it's just not in the Bible. And uh, I know that there's been a lot of explanations. All of them are confusing to me. And, and you know, I'm not the I'm not the sharpest tool in the woodshed, but I still don't understand a lot of those arguments and where you get it from. It's all eisegesis at its finest. There are some proof texts that are lifted out to try to prove that this is what baptism is, but, beloved, it just simply is not. It is not what the Bible teaches. What you saw tonight was an illustration of what the Bible teaches about believer's baptism. When a person comes to understand that they are lost, and then they put their faith in Christ alone. They turn to Jesus and Jesus only. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And when a person comes and turns to Christ and puts their faith in Christ, 
That is the moment that they are in the family of God. And baptism is simply choosing to make it public, to confess that you are in Christ, that you are on the Lord's team. When I was little, every summer, at the beginning of summer, my mother would sign us all up for Little League Baseball. Man, I look forward to that. Every year signing. And we would have to go down to this. uh, It was actually a church not far from our neighborhood that was actually, you would go there. They had sign-ups there. You'd go in, and my mother would pay the fees, and, and I would be signed up, and I would be placed on a team, and immediately I was officially a Little League Baseball player. Now, I didn't have my uniform yet. And I remember we would always practice, 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 practice. We would always practice without our uniforms. But finally, there came the day, and this was always exciting for Little League baseball players. Some of you that have done this, you can relate. When the coach would bring these big boxes with them to practice, and what were in those boxes? They were our uniforms. And then he would just give out our uniform to all of us. We would all try it on. We'd all be standing there in our uniforms looking the same. Now, the uniform was so exciting, getting that uniform and and being able to wear it. It was always exciting as as a Little League player. Now, putting on my uniform didn't make me part of that team. I became part of that team the moment I signed up for that team. But I Everyone could tell which team I was on when I wore my uniform. And that's what baptism is. Baptism is putting on the uniform of Jesus Christ and letting all the world know whose team you're on. The uniform doesn't put you on the team. You got on the team the moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ. The uniform came a little bit later. Thank God for all those who put their uniform on tonight and did it the way the Bible says. Let's bow for prayer together. Father, we're so very grateful for the word of God and the gospel, how it saves souls, strengthens lives, transforms lives. Thank you, Lord, for these tonight that you have worked in their heart. Many of them, Lord, have had a spiritual journey where they've come to the place where they got the full assurance that they were a child of God. And it was their heart's desire, Lord, just to follow you, completely, totally follow you. And tonight, Lord, I believe you were pleased and honored and glorified with the testimonies, with these who publicly confess Christ. Father, bless them as they follow you. Help them to be faithful in the word of God, faithful in their spiritual disciplines, church attendance, reading the word of God, praying, seeking your face. And Lord, may they grow in grace and may, Lord, they produce much fruit for your honor and your glory. We pray in Jesus' name.